<laughs> okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. It's a little bit after 12, so we have some more people coming, but they can just come in. So first, we want to thank you for coming. My name is Shabon Minish. I'm the lead teacher in the infant classroom across the street at CDL. Tiffany, you want to introduce yourself? I'm Tiffany Kors, and I'm assistant to Shabon at the CDL. So today we're going to be talking about facilitating self-regulation with infants using individualized strategies. That's really just a bunch of big words that means we're going to try and give you guys some strategies for when your child freaks out and throws himself on the floor and can't control their emotions. So, um, so when you think about infants, what's the first thing you think about? Crying. Crying. What else? We had different experiences. Yeah. <laughs> Two very different children, right? Yeah. So, how many of you have ever actually seen a child, an infant of any sort? Okay. Also. How many of you have ever seen a child screaming or throwing a temper tantrum or being extremely happy? Maybe one minute they're happy, the next minute they're screaming, crying on the floor, right? They're a little bipolar sometimes. You never know what you're going to get with infants because they're pretty much just this big ball of energy and emotions, and they don't know what to do with them. So before we get started, I want to ask, when was the last time you felt an emotion that you did not know what to do with it? Like it was so big, and it was, whether it was anger, you were really ticked off at your boss about something, or... You know, you were really sad about something and you just didn't know what to do with it. How did that feel? Frustrating. 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 Yeah. Horrible. Like you were not in control of the situation. Well, that's what infants feel like a lot of the time. Because they've only been on this earth for, you know, a few months, maybe a year, a little over a year. So they don't know what to do with their emotions. Thankfully, we're adults and we usually know how to deal with our emotions and we know what to do and what's socially acceptable. Sometimes we don't want to do what's socially acceptable, but we know how to regulate those emotions. So today we're going to talk about how to maybe help infants regulate those emotions. And let me go ahead and say, this is not going to be a um, fix-all course. You're not going to walk out of here and have like the magic pill that you can give your child and they're just going to immediately self-regulate. I wish we could do that. If we could, we'd be making a lot more money, but we don't. So hopefully we will give you some tips and tools that you can use. So what we are going to cover in this is what self-regulation is, um, when it begins to occur, what it looks like, um, why it's so important, and then we're also going to give you some individualized strategies because it's so important to meet the kids on their own, um, and why it's essential for facilitating self-regulation, and then we're also going to give you specific strategies that you can use at home or for those of you who are teachers in the classroom. So what is self-regulation? Self-regulation, this is a big terminology thing. Basically, when kids have emotions they don't know what to do with, it kind of expounds and it comes out. Self-regulation is kind of a way for them to bring it in and know what to do. So it's not really one thing. It's several processes that happen. Um, and it's actually part of the executive function of the brain, which includes cognitive flexibility, inhibitory control, and working memory. So there's a lot that goes into self-regulation. That's why kids aren't just going to immediately know, okay, I'm crying, I'm really sad, this is what works for me. There's a lot of processes that go into it, and it takes a while for it to develop. So the process for moving from intentional regulation, which is where most of the infants are, and that means like when we come up to them and we say, you know, okay, let's calm down, let's breathe, give them gentle touches, things like that, to where it's automatic regulation that they can do without external control, that's called internalization. And children first start regulating their emotions and their behavior through the external controls. So whenever you go up and you give them a hug or you give them a blanket or they start sucking their thumb, things like that, that's initially through physical and then verbal. So you start off actually giving them touches and then you can start telling them, you know, it's time to calm down, it's time to, you know, be cool, be calm, whatever words you typically use. So the goal is to help children reach the next step where they're able to do that all by themselves. They don't have to have a teacher, they don't have to have a parent tell them what to do. They can just do it for themselves. That is probably not going to happen when they're infants. I'll just go ahead and tell you. It's 
probably not going to happen while we're young toddlers either. It's probably going to take a few years. Now there might be situations where they can feel in control of their emotions and they can calm down and they can be, you know, okay. But we don't typically see that when they're infants. What we're going to talk about today is things that can help them get to that point, even though they are still infants. And, and continuing showing and modeling how to do it and putting words to it makes it easier for when they are able to do those things. Because, because they've heard about it, they've seen us doing it with them, and they heard the words from us. So when they get to the point where they can do it themselves, it's not unfamiliar. Okay, so when does it start to occur? Executive functioning of the brain actually starts during the preschool years and it develops the most rapidly of any time in their life. Um, and the ability to delay gratification, which is a huge part of learning self-regulation, begins in the child's first year of life. And I know some of you are thinking, wait, delaying gratification, you mean they don't get exactly what they want when they want it? That starts now? It does. Believe it or not, it starts when they're infants. Um, and it continues throughout childhood. So we start when they're infants and then continue. So that's why it's so important to start now giving them the tools that they need so that when they get older, they can do it on their own. Um, newborns and young infants actually already exhibit self-regulation. So if you're talking to an infant, and especially like newborns and very young children, and you're really loud, and you're really out there, you're really excited, and then they kind of like turn their head away from you, and they like start sucking your thumb and go to sleep. Has anybody ever seen that? It's because you're way too much for them, and they are all done. And you know, so for them, shutting down is self-regulation. That's them saying, I'm done with you, get away from me, lady, and just leave me alone, and I'm going to go to sleep until I can process all this. So, you know, they already have that skill. They already have some of the skills, so we're just going to start building on those. So research has shown that the development of self-regulation is important for several reasons. Um, one of the big ones is it helps later in their school career. Um, kids who can self-regulate typically end up performing better in academics. They show fewer behavioral problems. And they're more socially competent than those who have difficulty self-regulating. So, I mean, if you think about it, if a kid is having trouble like calming down when they get really mad and they like start hitting people around them, generally the other kids aren't going to want to be around them. I mean sometimes, but generally the other kids are going to move away from them and so they're going to have trouble making friends. They're also going to have trouble concentrating on things because they don't really know what to do with their body, they don't know what to do with their emotions. Um, and so basically the ability to regulate emotions and behavior, it allows the children to play without interruption. It allows them to make those connections with their friends or make friends and they can learn more about the world around them. So we're going to talk about individualized strategies and pretty much that's a big word for saying you know your child, you know what's going to work best for them, so that's what you need to do. And instead of like doing this big broad thing, sometimes it's better to kind of hone in and say, okay, my child needs this the most, so we're going to work on this. And, you know, those of you who are teachers, you know the kids in your classroom, you know what they need. Like in our classroom, our kids run the gamut from, you know, super, super excitable to really calm, and so we use different strategies for them. Like one child, we might need to use more of the calming techniques. Another child, you know, he needs a lot of big body movement. So really what we're, we're saying to do is use the different techniques, but see which one works best for your child or your, the children in your class. It's going to be different for each one because as we know, all children are different and they don't develop the same. Well, I also found like even then they're interested in like the big body play, which is a lot of what they, what we work on with them. Um, they're only interested in, on the fringes of it. Like we do a lot of tumbling and um, one of our kids is really interested in watching the other kids do it or being right on the end, the fringe of it, but he doesn't necessarily want to do the, the bouncing and the rolling and that kind of stuff. He's just interested in watching them. So he's interested in the big body play. He hasn't just got interested or comfortable with doing all of the activity of it yet. So basically introduce them to everything and make sure that they have a variety of things to pull from, whether they're interested in it yet or not. Um, so modeling emotions and feelings, one of the most important ways that you can start helping children with self-regulation is modeling it yourself. Um, 
whenever you're doing regular activities, like changing a diaper or things like that, you can comment on the child, you know, oh, you're smiling, it looks like you're happy, it looks like you're having a good time when they're playing or things like that. Uh, demonstrate appropriate behavior and language for children. So whenever you're having a conversation with like your spouse or the other teachers or any other adults in the room or with the child, really model the best way to like show emotions and use the appropriate words like happy and sad, you know, label those for them. And the big thing when you label your own emotions, I've seen this and it kind of drives me crazy, don't smile at a child when you're telling them that, they're, that you're upset at them. Because what do they see? They see you smiling and they see you happy and then you're, I'm so upset right now, I could just strangle you. <laughs> I mean, you know, and what do they hear? They hear you saying that you're mad, but they see that you're happy. So they're going to take the facial cues a lot faster than they are what you're saying. So if you're upset, it is okay to use an angry face and say, I'm, I'm very upset. You scared me. That was not safe. And let them know so that they can understand, you know, okay, she's mad. This is what mad looks like. This is how it's okay for me to show that I'm mad. Um, another way is to carefully label their emotions. We really want to be careful with this because sometimes we might say, oh, look how happy you are. And they're not actually really happy. They're, you know, maybe they're excited or maybe they're actually kind of sad but they're putting on a happy face you never know so just be careful so what we do a lot of times in our classroom is we say things such as I see you smiling it looks like you might be happy if I were in this situation I would be happy too you know you don't want to say oh look how happy you are that's just great you know and then move on um, we don't want to make it, we don't want to label it incorrectly and then make the child feel like what they're feeling is wrong. So I've seen that happen a couple of times where a child's confused because they're really happy about something and the adult thinks they should be sad and so they say, you know, oh well, you look so sad. No, the child doesn't look sad. The child looks really happy and he feels really happy but now he feels like he should be sad. And, you know, that happens a lot of times like when kids fall and get hurt. If they're not really that upset and the teacher or the parent comes in running over and, oh my gosh, are you okay? Or you look like you're hurting. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry that happened. The child's fine, but because they see that the parent or adult is really upset, they think, oh my gosh, I'm supposed to be upset. I'm going to start freaking out and crying now. So give them a moment, see what it is, and try not to do it incorrectly. I think also another one is um, like if, if somebody, if a classmate or a, a sibling has hurt another one, classmate or sibling, and they're smiling because they're not quite sure what's going on, I can say if, if that happened to me, I would be sad. Because some, like, if they're pulling their hair, they think it's funny. They, you know, he's, he's hurt, but I think it's funny. You know, if you pull my hair, it hurts me and it makes me sad. So then, he, even though he can't see his sibling because he's yanking him from the back or something, you, you're letting them know what they're doing is hurting somebody else. So another way that you can model the emotions and feelings is to use hints and clues as far as, you know, what the child's feeling. So use directions, touch, gestures to kind of give clues about how and when to regulate emotions. So this can involve like a child being super, super upset and just coming over and kind of rubbing their back or patting their hair and things like that to kind of cue, okay, it's time to, it's time to start calming down. You can use words, you know, let's, let's take a deep breath and so we'll, we'll go into that more later in the presentation. Um, another thing to remember is whenever you're using calming words and giving cues like that, some children may not want you to touch them. Some children may be like, get away from me, I don't want you to, this is not helpful for me. So just back off and let them, let them regulate on their own. Um, another thing that we do in our classroom is using books to help children understand their emotions. Books are a really great resource. We use books in our classroom for everything from separation anxiety, like Owl Babies, we were just reading that earlier, um, and then like Stella Luna is feeling different or making friends. You know, you can use books for anything, even with infants. And so some of the ones that we really love in our classroom, right now, Happy Hippo, Angry Duck is our favorite book. I know the book by heart because we've had to read it so many times. 
Um, and so another great one is My Many Colored Days by Dr. Seuss. And it goes through all of these different emotions and it uses color to kind of say what the emotions are. And all of these come in board books. So you can use them with infants, toddlers. Um, they also come in, you know, big books or paperbacks. So you can use them with older children too. Um, the feelings book. This one kind of goes through even different emotions like being silly, being, uh, I think one of them is being crazy. Or, so it's not just like the happy, the sad, the mad, the angry. Um, it's all kinds of different. And so with books, it kind of helps them connect it in a way that they understand, in a way that they can visualize and take in more than like if we tell them, oh, when I'm angry, I feel like this. Well, they can't see that. So books can show them like the angry faces and things like that. And when you're reading these books, it's also great to make the faces yourself. So like if you're reading Happy Hippo, Angry Duck, are you happy as a hippo and you make the happy face? Or are you angry as a duck, maybe sad as a chicken and you make the sad face? Can you sadly say cluck cluck? Things like that. So that way they can see it and they can really connect it. Another big one that we do, and we started doing this last year and we saw great results with it and so we started doing it this year too, is doing yoga and deep breathing. Um, how many of you guys have heard of doing yoga with infants or young children? Yeah, your child did it last year with us. So, um, it's kind of a new thing that's it's become more popular recently. But yoga is a great way for children to learn about their personal space and then how to calm themselves down and regulate their breathing. Now, I will say, infants are not going to sit there and when you tell them to do deep breathing, they're not going to start doing deep breathing. We're working on it, but they're, they're not actually going to do it. Um, a lot of times what we do is, as we're doing the moves, we'll model it ourselves. And so you Everybody take a deep breath. And out. And so kids, even though they won't do that, they see you doing that, and sometimes they start regulating your breathing with you, even though they don't realize that they're doing it. Um, so that's, doing the yoga really helps them. It also helps strengthen the adult and child bond. I mean, because you're on the floor with them, you're helping them go through all these moves, and they're really close to you. And a lot of the moves that we do, um, they sit in our lap, or you know, we hold them close, and we do like the different reaches and everything. So it's really close, and so that kind of strengthens the bond. So they feel a lot more safe in the classroom or with their parents. And so when they feel safe, that means that they're able to regulate better. That means that they can calm down and can help their emotions a little bit better. Um, it also provides stress release. A lot of times infants are facing stress from all kinds of different things, and don't, you know, we may not realize it, but getting to move their body, it releases endorphins and it helps them kind of let some of that go. Um, and it also helps them realize where their body begins and ends. Sometimes when they get really angry and upset, they just kind of go everywhere. And, you know, they don't know how to stop. And so this kind of helps them understand, okay, well, my body's right here. The ground's right here. This is where I can be. And I'm okay. I'm safe. I'm comfortable. I can breathe. It's all right. Um, one of the amazing things we noticed with the deep breathing, even though we, we weren't expecting the children to do it, Siobhan was sitting with one of our little girls in, um, in her lap, and she was really upset. And Siobhan, she just said the words, you know, we're going to take a deep breath, and she did it. And I think just her feeling Siobhan doing it, she, I mean, she calmed down right away, and we were like, well, we wish we got that on video. Really? Wish we because video. we weren't even expecting it, but she could feel Siobhan, I think, kind of, take the deep breath and then let it all go and she just she just immediately calmed down and we looked at each other I mean we were just as surprised as anything we could have seen so and she was fine with like can you talk just for a minute about like how you um but how you like what moves and that yeah. you guys do is that okay yeah we're going to show the picture okay. next <laughs> so these are pictures of our babies doing yoga so um, in the top corner up there, that's me doing, it's kind of a mix between boat and child's pose. And so basically you have the child and you stretch them out as far as you, I'm trying not to move this thing, I'm just going to hold this for a second. Um, so you stretch out 
and you let the child stretch out as much as possible. And so a lot of times they'll start laughing and they'll start giggling and so you know just let them laugh and giggle. Uh, this one right here in the middle, Meredith, we do toes to nose and you start off with the child on their back and you pull their feet up to touch their nose and so eventually the kids start doing it by themselves. Mm -hmm. Meredith's our own little yogi and she just does everything on her own now. Um, she could leave the class in yoga and it would be fine. But so that's pulling it up and they kind of take a deep breath as they have their legs up and then they let it down and then we do that a couple of times. We do each of the moves a couple of times. Um, and so then this picture right here, we're, this was at the very beginning of learning to do yoga, so it was still really funny and it was still really fun. Um, and so you, this was trying to do down dog where they lean over and a lot of the kids, they just would want to sit down and like make you push them over and everything. So that was the beginning. And then this right here is after they've learned it better. This is, you know, they're actually able to do it. So it's a big process. And then these two right here, they're doing reach for the stars. And so any children, any child can do this, whether they're mobile or non-mobile. They just reach their arms up and then they bring them down and bring them up. So there's different moves that you can do for children who are mobile and not mobile or non-mobile. So like with the non-mobile children, a lot of times you'll have them sit in your lap and you can just take their arms and stretch them over their head. And while you're doing it, make sure that you're breathing very deep and you're very calm and you're very collected and they'll be laughing and they'll be giggling because they're having fun and that's okay. We want them to, to be happy. We want them to be smiling and we want them to feel like this is an enjoyable experience. That way whenever they are upset and you're doing the deep breathing and sometimes you can do stretches with them, then they'll be able to find that happy place that they had before and kind of calm down. So with, with mobile infants, you get to do a lot more fun poses where they stand up and they reach down and touch their toes and they reach back up. And you can do like the horse pose where they're on all fours and you bring one of their legs out and you make a neigh noise. They love that. They think that's hilarious. Um, but if you go online and you search for infant yoga poses, there's a ton of them out there. There's even a book, um, Itsy Bitsy Yoga. And it's an entire book of just poses that you can do with even the youngest infants to toddlers. So that's that's a really great resource if it's something that you'd like to look into. So what does it look like if you want to do this at home? You can introduce children to yoga poses that they're able to do either alone or with adult assistance that we were just talking about. A lot of times when you're first starting to do it, you're really going to have to do the poses with them and like show them how to do it and they might not do it at first. It's okay. They'll, they'll eventually get it. Like we didn't think that our kids were really getting into it at all. And there was one point where I was like, okay, well, do we even really need to stop? And then one of our kids just goes over and does down dog and looks at me and starts laughing. It's like, okay, well, we'll keep doing it then. That's good. I'm glad you guys are enjoying it. So, um, so like I said, reach for the stars, down dog, toes to nose. Those are some different poses. And while doing poses, model deep breathing. Make sure they see what that looks like. Um, when a child becomes upset, it's a good opportunity for you to start working on the self-regulation where you hold the child in your lap and you take deep breaths. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to do anything. Just kind of have their head close to your chest and breathe. And in and out and in and out. And it may take a little while, but usually the kids will start breathing themselves and they'll start calming down. and. Um, and then you can even ask them if they want to do stretches with you. Like some of our kids get really upset and we'll ask them, do you want to stretch? Do you want to do reach for the stars? And they'll start doing it. And they're still a little upset, but then once they start doing it, they start calming down more. Um, but don't force it if the children are interested. I mean, there might be some kids you look at them and say, hey, do you want to do down dog while they're upset? And they're going to look at you like, are you insane? No, leave me alone. Do you see that? Crying right so now? we also found, um, Siobhan was talking about the day that we were wondering if they were getting it or enjoying it or not. And, uh, one of the kids did the down dog. We also had a few parents that came in and said, you know, they did the funniest thing, <laughs> you know, because we write daily sheets and we said that we did yoga or learned, learned a new pose. And they came in, Meredith, she was talking about, and her mom said that she was doing down dog and reached for the stars in the car, 
you know, so we're with those two combined things, we're like, okay, this is really connecting and we're going to continue with it. And I've even seen some kids, there's a couple of them, when they get really upset, they'll automatically, like, it's hard to do, but you get down on your knees and you put your arms straight out. And we've seen a couple of kids, they're really, really upset and they just automatically go into that pose. And I don't think they realize what they're excuse me, what they're doing, but they're starting to breathe deeper and they're starting to, you know, regulate their breathing. So that's really been awesome to see is, you know, the kids starting to do that on their own. Or even if we say, you know, let's calm down, they'll automatically like lay on the floor and kind of look at me like, okay. And then you see this. them popping all around, you know, one yeah. fall, you know, with everything, a tummy hurts, everybody's tummy hurts, everybody yeah. does yoga all at the yeah. same time, you know, <laughs> so it, it's fun to see. Um, another thing is soothing touch. A lot of times we do this kind of naturally. You don't really think about this, but when a child's upset, what's the first thing you do? You hold them and you kind of rub their back or you pat their hair, and you don't really think about doing it, but it's something that's extremely helpful. Um, it can be used as a cue to regulate. So when a child's really upset and you just automatically start holding them, that's their cue to, okay, I'm safe, I'm okay, I can calm down, I can start breathing again. Um, so it's really useful when you combine it with the deep breathing. So a lot of times in our class what we do whenever kids get really upset is just rub their back and breathe. And sometimes we'll say things like, you know, you look really, really upset what happened. They may not answer, but it's it's starting to get them to think about what just happened to them. And when they get older, they can actually respond. They can say, you know, so-and-so took my toy, so-and-so hit me, you know, I'm really ticked off because we're having peas for lunch instead of carrots, whatever. Um, and the important thing to remember about soothing touch is if a child's moving away and doesn't seem interested in it, don't push it. This can be a huge way to make it ten times worse. If they don't want you to touch them and you just go over and grab them anyway, um, it's, it's not going to be pretty. Also, with, with that, like she was saying, if they don't want it to, they move away, you just be like, I understand that you're either upset or sad, whatever you're labeling for them. I just want you to know that we're here for if you want to come back and sit with us or if you want to come back and read a book. So you're letting them know that you understand they have that emotion <coughs> and like you've tried to, to to regulate with them or help them with whatever is going on. And if they feel like they want to come back to you, that's fine. You're a safe home base for them. Uh, <laughs> go ahead. So the fun one that all the kids love is music and movement. I mean, my kid doesn't like to jump up and dance and move around to music. As a matter of fact, this morning we finished with yoga and um, one of the children uh, started pointing at the radio and it's like okay you don't have to do the yoga anymore let's go do that you know so um but children who are exposed to music and movement they end up research shows that they are better able to self-regulate um, and there's a combination of reasons why and they say it's because you know listening to music with differing tempos and speeds it kind of um like when they're listening to it and moving their body they start associating fast with happy, slow, with sad, even if you don't really tell them that, like research has shown they start thinking about that. So if you play like a really slow song, the children start calming down more. And we've seen this in our classroom, like if you play like classical music that's very slow, the children will typically be, you know, playing very slow and they'll, things will be calmer, there won't be as much hitting or yelling or things like that. Um, if you play the Peanuts uh, soundtrack, it's horrible. Don't ever play it in your classroom or for your children because they go crazy. Every class that we've ever had that we've done it with, for whatever reason, the tempo is extremely fast. And they just are jumping around. And, I mean, it's, it's funny to see because they just, it, you know, you can play one song and then play one of those and night and day difference. Um, so having to wait for a turn to use materials, so like if you're playing and you're doing music and movement, and you only have a couple of maracas, and so one of them has to wait to use one. You know, that's working on self-regulation, because they don't get what they want right when they want it. They have to learn to wait, and they're going to be really, really upset, and that's okay. It's okay for them to be upset, because that works on delayed gratification, that nice little thing we talked about earlier, and we're going to talk more about later. Um, it also gives the children an opportunity to move their bodies in ways that they don't get to throughout the day. 
So, I mean, if you think about an infant, a lot of times what we do is we pick them up and we move them from place to place. They don't really get to do very much on their own sometimes. With music and movement, they get to do whatever they want in this space and do things that, you know, they might not really get to do otherwise. And it kind of helps them kind of realize, okay, you know what, I'm, I'm good, I got this, I'm, I'm okay. So, do you want to add something? I, I also wanted to say, like, um, without giving them any cues with the fast and slow music, like when we would turn on slower music, like maybe about a week or so after we had done the yoga, when we would turn the yoga music on, you could see them just, they would walk across the room with their arms up for reach for the stars, or if they were right around where our area is to do this thing, they would immediately lay on their backs for like toast and nose. Or if I had turned on faster music, I wouldn't even say it's time for, you know, baby tumbling or music and movement. They would already just naturally start, you know, bouncing to dance or looking for the big ball that we use. So even without our, our verbal cues, they would understand, you know, the fast and the slow, like what kind of things we do with the music that we play before we even said anything for them. Okay, and this is a video of... We do baby tumbling in our classroom, um, and it's just an opportunity for kids to really get to move with props and um, big materials. So I don't know if you'll be able to hear it, but... So, the sound's not really working, so... But basically what you see is we've got like a big ball, and we've got a big foam, cylinder thing and so they can bounce on the ball they can roll over the ball um, we encourage them to do specific moves with them but they don't have to um, I mean like right up here we were asking them to roll over the ball but Laura Claire would decide she wanted to ride it like a horse and that's fine meanwhile Ethan's over here dancing and not doing anything with the, the props and that's okay this is you know music and movement with infants shouldn't really be very structured. It should be more, um, you know, we're going to move, we're going to do whatever, however you feel like you need to move. And the, the video that we just showed was after they had been doing it for like three or four weeks. When we first brought out, I just, uh, I initially just did down here on the bottom where mommy is over his belly over the thing, the, the roll. They all just swarmed me because it was new. They didn't know what it was. And now, now they know, like you can see, in, um, he's waiting here, you know, once in the back, he's like, okay, I gotta wait my turn. So now they kind of, they, they kind of swarm around the mat and they watch the kids go over, over their bellies um, and they wait. It, when we first started, you know, it's gonna be a process because they, they all wanna see what's new and what's going on. But um, on, on the ball here, up top, what we do is we have them uh, on their belly and we roll forward and back so they're aware, you know, they, they kind of hold their, their core so they have they understand that they have to kind of hold themselves up or let it go. We also, we don't have a picture of it, but we also have them do it on their back. Um, on the video you showed where I, I had one of our um, kids, he was sitting up and I was bouncing them and then I would roll him this way because he has to be aware how to move his body to keep himself from falling. So that was really good and um, a therapist told us about that, that it's good for, for all, each of those things. And we have um, a variety of different musical tools up in the front. We have, well, I would say maracas, but they have bells and clappers and xylophones. Um, we also have a variety, like parachutes, puppets down here we do, and then the tumbling. So we do a lot of different things. And the fun thing about it is that this is all stuff that real, I really thought would be fun for them. And I didn't know that it was regulation or our self-regulation or making them more aware. I just thought it was fun for the babies, which is probably what they're thinking too, you know? Um, <laughs> so I was really excited when I asked Siobhan, I thought she was going to think that I was crazy that I, I wanted to do these things, and she said that would be perfect. So I was really excited. <laughs> and then we also, um, often we also have like parents or this is Darius, he's a sub that comes in and works with our kids, and he said one day that we, he played a ukulele. So we kind of hunted Darius down and made sure that he remembered his ukulele one day. And he was, him. yeah, we definitely <laughs> stalked him. He was really, really nice about letting the kids play. He taught them how to strum. They always wanted to, to play with the, the little knobs on the top and things. So he was really, um, he came in and he, 
he played the same song like eight times so we could say all of the kids' names in the song, which he thought was funny, and the kids were amazed because they, we said their names. And he wasn't worried about them touching the ukulele and stuff. And we've had other parents come in. Today we had, um, Aunt Jeanette is a teacher, but she's also one of our students. Um, that's her mom. And she did puppets with us. And she was amazed at how well they sat. I mean, we, we, they come and they sit. We don't say it's time to sit down and do puppets. But they'll sit through the whole bag. So Our kids have gotten really good about learning which times you know they need to sit down, which times they can stand up and run around and play. And that's nothing, like we haven't really forced that, but through our cues to self-regulate, they've started learning calm times, quiet times, um, and then also excited and loud times too. And you, um, it's kind of funny because like, I didn't notice it until one time Siobhan was going to answer the phone. Whenever we go, where our phone sits is where our iPod is also. If we head that way, they're like, oh yes, you know, what are we going to do? So they're, they, you know, it's not like, we do these things every day, you know, sometimes two or three times a day, depending on the you know, weather or, you know, if, if they're like pointing and talking to us about it and wanting to do it. So, I mean, they're very interested and they understand that, that that's kind of the area you, know, you can tell we kind of got it all going in the same spot. But Which I don't know if I put it on any of the slides, but routine is a huge way to help children self-regulate. I mean, if you think about it, one of the times that kids get most upset is when they think that they're supposed to be doing something, and it's different. I mean, you can lose an entire classroom because today you decided instead of doing puppets first, you wanted to do you know art time. I, they don't know what's going on, and so they freak out. So one of the ways to help them self-regulate is to try and keep a consistent routine. And when you do have to vary, say, you know, okay, I know we usually do this, but today we're going to have to do this because of this reason. So doing it at home or doing it in your classroom, it doesn't have to be like this huge, big thing. I mean, you can just sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star when they're upset. Um, music can be a huge way to calm down a child. We have one child who at the beginning of the year, anytime he would get upset, the only way to calm him down was to sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. We were singing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star probably about 32 times a day. That was like when people stood up to move, came in, went was, out. You know, it got to where as soon as you'd stand up, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, <laughs> as you're walking across the room, because he was so, you know, but that calmed him down. And so knowing things like that really helps. Um, Whenever you're doing it, try and set up a safe environment so that they can do what they want to. Um, so they don't have. So you're not worried about them hitting their head like on a chair or things like that. So they can move and be free and actually move in the way that they want to, and you don't have to be worried about that. Another thing to remember: it's okay if you can't dance. I can't dance. I will freely admit that I'm horrible at dancing. The kids don't care. You know, as long as you're over there moving with them and bouncing up and down, we, ha we do what we call the infant squat instead of the cupid shuffle, where they bounce up and down and they have their arms out. I mean, every infant in our classroom does it, and they just bounce up and down, up and down. Your child does it amazingly. She, like, leads all of our, our dance parties. Yeah. Yep. So a lot of times, like, if they see you doing what they're doing, it helps them build their self-confidence and they feel better about themselves. So it's like, oh my gosh, this adult that I really care about, she's doing what I'm doing. That's pretty cool. Um, another thing is to use different props. Like we have like the big exercise ball and stuff, but it doesn't have to be like that. I mean, you can even just use like the cushions off of your couch. Just put them on the floor and let them roll over those or tumble on those if you're comfortable with that. I know some people would freak out about that. My mother is one of them. But, you know, let them do things like that that they might not otherwise get to do. Get like a laundry basket. Let them climb in and out of it as long as it's not full of clean clothes. Um, you know, do different things that they're not used to. Um, and also just play like different music in the car or at home while they're waiting for things. You know, playing a variety of music that could be connected to happy emotions or sad emotions. And sometimes you can even say the song sounds a little sad because it's slow. Or this song sounds really happy. It makes me really happy because it's got a really good beat. Um, and then another thing to remember is unrestricted movement can be very calming for some children. Some kids really need to do that big body movement to let their emotions get out. It's almost like an exorcism for them. I mean, letting it all get out. And you know, and if you're telling them, no, you need to calm down, you need to sit down, and you need to stop doing that, 
Well, that's not going to help. It's going to make it ten times worse. Just, you know, as long as they're not hurting themselves or hurting somebody else or they're in a situation where they can do the unrestricted movement, it can really help calm them down. And, and big body play doesn't have to be like baby tumbling, like she was saying. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes is the whole body. That's a song that you use your whole body or hokey pokey or Simon Says. We don't do a lot of those two songs yet, but we do, you know, a lot of head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Um, and I just wanted to show you, I've talked about earlier, but you see Ethan, he's on the ball. So he's trusting me because when we first started this, when I, when I would just sit them on it, you would see the look of terror. So then I would immediately say, it's okay if you don't feel safe, I take them off. And we always had, um, from the beginning, we had one child, um, he just loves the ball. So when I would do that to him, uh, other kids would do it, and now, you know, they all let me lay them back or forward. And we, I mean, we literally go all the way around. So because he could model for them, how I was safely doing it, now they all enjoyed the ball work. Okay, and our, the last strategy we're going to talk about is using art and sensory play. Um, art's kind of self-explanatory. You know, a lot of times when kids are painting or using different materials, it just helps them to calm down. It helps them to, you know, move their body in a, in a way that's a little bit smaller movements. Um, and sensory play can really, really, really be helpful for some kids. Some kids really need to like feel something. Like, I'm one of those people who, if I'm nervous, I have to like play with things. I have a screw up here that I've been playing with the whole time. You know, and kids are the same way. Like, they need something between their hands to kind of be moving and to kind of like feel the different textures. So, like here we have oats in a bucket, and they're just playing with it. Um, these are the polymer crystals where you add water to them and they get bigger. Um, so just providing a lot of different things for them to feel and to play with and kind of, you know, move small movements instead of all of the big ones. And then also like using art, you know, they start painting with different colors and kind of associate, like, we associate different colors with different emotions. And they're starting to learn that when they're younger. Um, so like allowing them to create what they want when they're doing art. Um, don't give too many restrictions. Try and focus on the process more than the product because that's going to help them really get their emotions out instead of like, you know, oh, let's make a turkey with your hand. Here's the colors. You do what you want to do. You do what you need to do. And make it stress-free as possible. I know some of you are probably thinking art and sensory is really messy and that stresses me out. It doesn't have to be messy. It doesn't have to be this big thing. Like one of the things that we do is we put paint inside of a Ziploc bag and just let them like hold it and squeeze it. And the paint stays right there, but they love it. They think it's one of the best things that we do. Um, so it doesn't have to be this big thing. You don't have to start going over, you know, what Picasso did in his blue period, if that's even really a thing. But, you know, you can <laughs> let them rip paper or just give them different pieces of fabric to feel. Things like that that's not messy, but it's still texture and um, different sensory things. Another thing to remember is to not judge a child's finished art project. I promise if your child is using a black crayon, they're not depressed. It's okay. They can use black or they can use, you know, brown and it's not really that they're sad. And also, you know, Sometimes we, we really want to tell them how pretty it is and how nice it looks. And maybe they didn't really want it to be pretty. Maybe they wanted it to be angry or upset. That's what you see a lot of times with the older kids. Like I remember one child, she was really upset about something and she just took a crayon and she, I mean, it, I was a little afraid of her watching her because she was so angry. And then once it was over, she was fine and she held it up. and. Another teacher looked at her and said, oh, well, that's so pretty. And she got really mad. I mean, she was it's not pretty. And she threw it away. So just be careful if whenever you're, you're looking at it, you know, you can talk about how they use green or they use blue and they use big strokes, things like that. Um, and you can encourage them to use a variety of materials and colors, but don't force it. Um, and so our last thing are things to remember. You want to remember to allow children to feel their emotions. I know especially with infants, we get caught up in wanting to kind of make it all better. And sometimes 
it's not going to be all better right then. Like when we tell a child you're okay or you're fine, that kind of minimizes how they're feeling. And we want to allow them to feel upset if they're feeling upset. I know, you know, when you have this screaming infant in your arms, you immediately want to make them stop crying. You want to make it better. And sometimes they need to learn to process that. And sometimes, you know, I'm not saying let the child scream for two hours and, you know, be sad the whole time. But they do need to start learning how to do that. <clears throat> Another thing to remember is that it might take a combination of strategies to calm the child. You might start off with like the soothing touch and the, the gentle words and things like that and move to something else. Um, and that's okay. It's not going to take just one. Don't feel like because the first thing that you tried didn't work, the child's never going to calm down. And also don't wait until the child's in the middle of a complete meltdown to start trying to work on self-regulation. That's not going to work. They're already past that point and they just need to, they, they need you to start giving them the cues. But it helps if they already know the cues. So, um, what may work for one child will not work for another. That's going back to using individualized things. Make sure you know what's going to work for your child. Self-regulation is a process. Like we said at the beginning, don't expect to go back and start doing some of these things with your kids and within like a day they immediately start smiling instead of being sad or you know they start crying about something and then oh but I'm okay because you tapped me on the arm you know it, that's not going to happen it's really a process and it's, it's going to take a while and so you just have to be consistent you have to keep working with it you have to keep offering them strategies that they can do on their own um, another reminder don't rescue them from their negative emotions they need to feel frustration and disappointment and sadness. I mean, if they're frustrated with something, you know, you can come over and help them if it looks like they need help, but don't automatically try and fix everything. Like if a child's screaming about something, don't just keep offering them things to see what's gonna get them to stop crying. Let them, you know, let them start working on it themselves. Let them start processing it. Um, and it's okay to show your child real emotions within reason. I say this because I've seen some really, really angry people, and you don't want to start throwing things against the wall and telling kids that that's an okay way to show their emotions. It's not. So, you know, but it's okay to let a child see that you're upset. It's okay to let a child see that you're angry. I know sometimes we're afraid to do that. We don't want them to see us angry or, you know, even afraid of something. But it, they need to see that so that they can see, okay, well, my mom is upset and this is what it looks like, and it's okay to be upset. When I feel upset, it's not, a, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Does that make sense? Um, just, just to go up one where it says children need to work through the frustration, at the beginning of the year, um, Siobhan, it's funny, she models a lot of stuff, probably not even knowing that I just, we just kind of catch on and work through. In the beginning of the year, you know, we don't know the kids, they don't know us, so when, when we're changing their diapers, and the other ones are kind of like milling around or getting upset or if we finish changing that child's diaper we have to set them down so we can clean the table and wash our hands and they're upset because we've let them go we just have to say we've changed your diaper I'm, I'm going to go ahead and set you down now so I'm still talking to them through it they, they probably don't really understand but my voice or my tone is just letting them know that I haven't forgotten or I see that they're frustrated and I'm going to fix it but I have to do this first yeah and instead of being like you know you're okay, you're fine, I'll be with you in a minute. Saying, you know, it'll just take me a minute. I mean, because, I don't know. If you were sitting in a vehicle, in your vehicle, and you're sitting at a red light, and suddenly somebody comes up and yanks you out of the car and drives off with your vehicle, and then you go to the police and you say, okay, this is what happens. And the police officer looks at you and goes, well, I can see you're really upset. I can see the tears coming down your face, but you're okay. You're fine. I mean, you had that car for, what, five years? So it's, it's their turn now. That's a lot of times what we do with kids. Like where, you know, oh, well, it's not your turn anymore. They took the toy. It's no big deal. It's just a toy. Here's one that looks just like it. I mean, it's, so we've got to really be careful when we tell kids, you're okay. You're fine. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're not okay, and they're not fine. And, you know, you saying that they are makes it worse. I mean, it, it really does. If somebody came up and told me something like that, I would be like, I'm not fine, get away from me. <laughs> so, does anybody have any questions, comments, concerns, stories they want to share of their own kids?
completely unacceptable. You're all over the place. You're not listening to my directions. So now we're going to sit and breathe. And people passed through us and crazy people. We're <laughs> <laughs> just like... Yeah. Half of them were probably <laughs> thinking, I wish and I could do that. And then you were like, okay, yeah. Yeah. now I can follow directions. I'm done. I mean, that's a part of knowing your child. Yeah. If you need to carry them out screaming and regulate them outside. They regulate in the car. It has to do with the parents, too. You have to be comfortable you know, right. yeah. doing whatever. And I think, I'm sure as teachers, that's the same for you guys. Yes, it definitely depends on your comfort level yeah. as well. Um, so, redirection mm -hmm. was a big word in the car, um, and I'm, I'm sure that's in here somewhere. That you you know you try to like when you're super upset about something, you try and redirect. Um, that doesn't work with either of my kids ever. They would look at me like I was stupid. Like I see you trying to show me that car. I don't care. I'm upset about this. So for the kids that uh, redirection doesn't work, any any suggestions? I don't remember what I did with Connor outside of. He would just, you know, have to get over it. Like, he would just have to work through it on his own. But Since I had to go with your, go through this with your child just this morning. Yes, <laughs> what did you do? Um, she was really upset because she wanted a toy that somebody else had. And so, you know, we tried the, okay, well, he has it right now. There are other toys you can play with. That didn't work. So what we ended up doing was her sitting there in my lap, and she was having a temper tantrum. And I just kept saying, you know, I'm right here. When you need me, let me know. I'm right here. And I kept breathing just very calmly. I didn't get, like, upset. And although at what point I want to be like, Laura Claire, knock it off. This is your get her out. She was 10 minutes ago. But, you know, and so finally, like, I think one of the other kids, like, walked past her. And she just suddenly realized, oh my gosh, there are other people around me. And she stood up and went off and was fine. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, it's, with her, she's, it's really just being patient and... Which is really hard when you're trying to cook yes. dinner and do this. And, yeah. and she's, you know, right here. Yep. I can't beat you up, I'm cooking oh, dinner. Yeah. So that's when her brother, I'm like, go play with your brother. Brother, come say it for me, because I can't <laughs> I can't do this all at the same time. I will, she, yeah. No, no, no. Not, I've also found like the same thing with her with what Shabam was just explaining. I'm like, I've off I've I've showed you that we can do A, B, and C and you've you've told me you don't want to do them, so I'm gonna let you sit here with me and then you let me know either if you wanna go play or if you change your mind on doing that. And she's kinda like that's going to work. <laughs> yeah, you know, you can just see it. We and call she it, looks at you like you're crazy. But, but she ends up falling She through. ends up doing something. I mean, it's, uh, I know, it's not a good answer. It's just, she's, the she is her own child. Directing doesn't work. It doesn't work. It, yeah. <laughs> It's kind of different for us, too, because we have both of us, you know, and it's kind of, you know, it's like what we're doing all day, and, you know, we're, we're not making dinner, so, you know. <laughs> but we are serving lunch to eight babies, and we have to be like, okay, we'll be with you in a second, or if you throw your mouth cup down, you're telling us you don't want it, so we're going to go ahead and set it aside until you say more, or, you know, you let us know that you're ready. So we kind of have to do our redirection a little bit differently than kitchen work, but, you know. Serving eight babies, lunches, yeah. Um, and real quick, so when you guys introduced these breathing techniques, was mm -hmm. it in your large group or did you kind of break them up? It was individual. Group? Okay. Um, and actually, we just started uh, doing a new pose this week that we call Big Breath. Um, and so during yoga time, as we're doing all this stuff, like we'll say, okay, it's time to do Big Breath. <gasps> and really having them blow it out. And so a couple of the kids have started trying it. Um, but to begin with, it's really just modeling it with the one-on-one. -on -one. Um, okay. And you just introduce one a day and then just, okay. Yeah. What we do with, like, the yoga is we have, like, four poses that we do a week. Um, and it turns into us doing all of the poses because the kids inevitably want to do them all. But so you, you stick with three of the same and then introduce a new one the next week or something like that. And so just modeling the deep breathing and kind of telling them to focus on it, understanding that they're probably not going to really focus on it yet. Um, but with older kids, it's definitely something you could do in a large group. Yeah, I was, I have, kind of, well, they're in the ones, but they're all mm -hmm. two now. So right. Yeah, this is going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> 
And you'll notice for the first few times, you're like, this is never going to work. I don't know what they were talking about, but it does work. I mean, yeah. you just continue doing it. And most of it is them seeing you do it. And then they're like, okay, that looks fun because she keeps doing it. It must yeah. be fun. You know, so. <laughs> and she's smiling. Like, so, you know, never mind that, you know, four of us are screaming, how do you do it with me? She's still smiling, so it must be okay. Awesome. I do it around the house. Yeah. Yeah. The next you find them in your crib, then you're down with dogs. Yeah. Yeah. And then put a list of that. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, I hope you have learned some nice strategies that you can use. Um, but I, I have one more question. Yeah. Okay, so sometimes there are things that they just have to do. Yeah. To brush your teeth, change your diaper, that they may hate. Right. Mm -hmm. What, how do you approach that? A lot of times what I do with those is I make them think that they have a choice. So like what if, if they, they when they reach the point where they're too smart to figure that, like yeah. mommy change your diaper or daddy change your diaper, when they go, I said no, mommy. Well, <laughs> oh. then the, that's when you when have to say, you know, it's really not a choice right now. It's not a choice. And you have to do this. But you can choose if you want me to do it or daddy to do it. That's your choice. But changing the diaper has to happen. And I have a daughter. She's older. She, she's, she's a freshman in college. But I also nanny for a three-year-old. And I found that I can do kind of the same thing. So I only give them choices that I can let them do. Listen, you can pass your class or you can't drive. You're not going to not drive and when you don't pass your class. Or, you know, or listen, mom's working, so I'm going to brush your teeth. Or if she's not working, I'd say, do you want mom or me to brush your teeth? If he has a choice, I'd let him choose. And it's both choices that I can deal with and live with. You know, and Jenna, she'll look at me like, I know what you're doing. <laughs> and I, that's why, but we're still going to do it, you know, this way. So, and he catches on. He brushes his own teeth now, and it's, and it's not as big as an issue. So I give him choices that I can live with and that he's both safe with. It's okay to, to say, we do that too. We're just don't really have a choice in this. Mm -hmm. So I tried to give you a choice, you chose not to take a choice, so no choice. So not a question. Now we're going to wash your hair and you'll scream the whole way through. <laughs> <laughs> and then you self-regulate yeah. afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> and then if you give them a choice that you don't, do you want to stay here and play until 8 or do you want to go home and have broccoli? Well, I want to stay and play till 8, <laughs> you know? So you give them the choices that you both can live with and you're both happy at the end of it. So. <laughs> I have a couple kids that want to eat broccoli. Oh, then <laughs> it's a choice that you could live with, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.